I'm Robert Bender. I've been the treasurer for the Victorian Humanists for the last three years. Um, joined the organisation, I think, about 1982, so just on 40 years now, half my life. Uh, <clears throat> I read Darwin's Origin of Species probably in my mid-30s. Loved it. Um, just suddenly understood a great deal more about how the world works and wanted to learn more. I've since read his Journal of the Beagle and several other of his books and several books about him, so a couple of big biographies, Desmond and Moore's big biography, and just always want to learn more. <clears throat> I've even been cheeky enough to give a couple of talks about Darwin, even though my background is I've got an accounting degree. It just forces me to become reasonably knowledgeable about something so I don't embarrass myself when I stand up to give a talk. And it's just a self-learning exercise for me. How do you think Charles Darwin has affected the culture of science? <clears throat> Natural selection <clears throat> and the whole business of the justifiability of accepting that evolution is the way the world has developed is now, as well, virtually everyone agrees, the whole basis for biology. It is fundamental. It is not a little add-on. It is the underlying, underpinning theory upon which all biology is based. Um, it's rather sad that uh, Darwin and Mendel never got together. Um, Mendel published his stuff in a very obscure Bavarian journal and no one discovered it until 20 years after Darwin was dead. And as a result, Darwin had no concept of a gene. He had no idea about how heredity worked. Um, so a great deal of what he wrote was pure speculation. And Mendel grounded him a great deal, which has been wonderful. And of course, since the Second World War, the um, Watson and Crick discovery of the structure of DNA has just set off evolutionary science in a whole new direction. But he, he started it and suddenly gave a mechanism for the obvious fact that life had developed over from simple to more complex organisms over millions of years. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of argument until the discovery of radioactivity that the Earth could not possibly have had enough heat in it to last the number of millions of years that evolution would have needed. Um, re read something about Lord Kelvin at one stage um, frothing at the mouth about the Earth could not be more than 20 million years old because it would cool so fast that it would just die um, <clears throat> in all that time. And then ra the radioactive uh, r substances were discovered and it was discovered that the Earth is loaded with them, which is obviously a tremendous source of heat, and therefore the possibility that the Earth was thousands of millions of years old suddenly was credible. So many people have contributed to our understanding of the very, very long history of life on planet Earth, but Darwin was absolutely crucial until he was so convincing about the mechanism of natural selection and the importance of the variability of every species and the selective death rate of the supernumerary offspring of virtually every species, um, no one could imagine how um, one life form could turn into another, even slowly. And that was just an absolutely crucial difference. Yeah. Darwin made predictions about what would be found, although these predictions weren't fulfilled until much later. Like he, he predicted that there'd be transitional fossils between the ones that, it, that were already known. And since then, there's been plenty of those transitions found. Um, yeah, so a, a few were actually known about in his time. Uh, the unearthing of a huge long lineage of horse fossils of all the equids was quite well known long before he died and that was obviously very very convincing and because it is such a good series of course it is one of the things that the creationists want to lampoon and say it's just nonsense because it's, it's obviously a huge threat to their strange belief system. One of the, the, the basic tenets of, of Darwin's idea is that all species are variable. Um, <clears throat> we're not uniform. You aren't the same as me. You've got all sorts of genetic differences. And because Darwin didn't know about genes, he couldn't talk in that way. Um, but reading Malthus's essay on the principle of population, uh, which was very much about the enormous potential for population increase in every species and Earth not being big enough to support every offspring. So given that most offspring die, uh, the question is, is it completely random or is there some sort of selectivity? 
and the essence of natural selection is there is selectivity. Of the variability within any particular species, some of those variables are more fit for survival and some are less fit. And there will be a selection with the less fit dying with much greater abundance than the, than the more fit. And the result is because those variations within the ones that do survive are inherited, um, their offspring will also have more different variabilities. And over many, many, many generations, the variabilities will change steadily. So eventually you get um, to a, a stage uh, after thousands or tens of thousands of generations where a species has in effect become a quite different species. And of course, um, in more modern times, as we become more adept at researching microbes, uh, we discover you actually get different species sometimes within days. We can actually see evolution in action. Well, it's what's, it's what's been happening with the um, coronavirus. Only three years ago, there was one variant of the coronavirus and we killed off most of it. And it turned out there was some variability within that coronavirus. And obviously the ones that survived uh, were a little bit different from the ones that we had killed off. And they have now generated several dozen different offspring, which our original vaccines don't deal with. In effect, they have evolved into not a different species, but they've got very different survival capacities, quite different from only three years ago. So uh, virtually as soon as the first vaccines were distributed, Omicron, or the, sorry, not Omicron, the, the Alpha variant, um, started evolving in a new direction, forced by what we were doing to it. And there was the same thing with um, rabbits when myxomatosis was first released in Australia in the 1950s. It killed off 99% of rabbits. So the question is, were the 1% that survived exactly the same as the 99% that didn't survive? And the answer is obviously no. They were more resistant. And so we bred resistant rabbits. And a, res a resistant rabbit is not the same animal as a non-resistant rabbit. It's evolved. And we're doing that to viruses now, which evolve at an amazing speed. As said, in, in real time. So, and it, it all makes sense because Darwin elucidated the variability and the selective death rate, and that's essentially what natural selection's about. <clears throat> Where would biology be without an understanding of evolution? <coughs> We've evolved also. We are more resistant than our great 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 grandparents to all sorts of things. There's an ongoing um, biological warfare going on between us and the parasites that would like to attack us. So we're different and they're different. We evolve more slowly because obviously the only thing that matters to us is the modification of our um, gonads. And I'm, I'm at 77, I'm not producing any gonads anymore. I'm not passing them on to anybody. So what's going on in my body is totally irrelevant to evolution. But before I gave birth to my children, it was very relevant. And once I had children and stopped producing children, it became irrelevant. There's nothing, nothing I can pass on to anybody now. But and for viruses, it occurs in literally minutes. So if, if we did not understand evolution, then we would still be um, very, very profoundly ignorant in our efforts to understand the nature of life on Earth and why there are millions and millions of species and so many of them obviously very, very closely related but we couldn't explain how they came to be different and how they came to be related. Now we can. It just makes sense. Uh, one, one mystery is the extremophiles. Um, we've comfortably assumed that oxygen breathing things are natural to planet Earth. And then people discovered all these bizarre things that live on volcanic vents under the ocean at <clears throat> a couple of hundred degrees Celsius which is death to us and we thought it was death to everything and it's not. So we are related to them because every living thing on earth is related to every other living thing on earth. How did that come to be? How can we possibly be related to the extremophiles um, which live on sulphur which would kill us? But obviously we are and that's one of the mysteries. It's, they've only been re recently discovered the last 30 or 40 years with very deep ocean research which wasn't possible until all that recently. Um, the, the process by which Darwin's warm little pond generated the first 
replicable organism is still subject to pretty intense research with lots of speculative stuff going on and the enormous difficulty of getting good evidence of that because it obviously occurred in some very narrow localised spaces <clears throat> which probably don't survive anymore because planet Earth's surface is always churning over. Not a great deal of the planet Earth's surface is as it was 4,000 million years ago. Most of it's subducted under volcanic um, or sort of tectonic plate edges and so on. So there's only a, a few bits left. Um, a little bit in Greenland, a little bit in Western Australia, a bit in Northern Canada, and most of the rest is quite much more recent. And a, a lot of the um, really ancient stuff uh, generated at the mid-ocean ridges has subducted, as I said, underneath the um, tectonic plate that it's meeting and just disappeared back into planet Earth. So we'll never see it again. Plus, whatever evidence it used to contain has been obviously destroyed by the tremendous forces that's subject to. So it is sheer, sheer luck that you find little spots that have these ancient surviving um, materials which help you to understand the origins of planet Earth. So the, explaining abiogenesis is one of those things that's still very, very much up in the air. Which again is why the creationists attack it. If you can't explain it, it didn't happen. Well, it's, it's one of the, the God of the gaps type problems. That as soon as you fill a gap, it ceases to be a problem and they stop talking about that. Yeah. But, yeah. So there's, there's lots of mysteries still to go. Um, <clears throat> no one still has ever seen a speciation event because you can't. It's something I've just been reading in uh, Daniel Dennett's Darwin's dangerous idea that you only know there was a speciation event thousands of generations later when you've got two species that obviously once upon a time were one and you can't say precisely in which generation whatever was the crucial event happened because it's not obvious at the time. Um, <clears throat> it's possible that you and I are a speciation pair because you're different from me. A million years from now we'll know if that's true and now we just can't say that and maybe you'll leave descendants and i won't it's again one of the fundamental ideas in darwin's origin of species that some sort of geographical barrier which separates two populations of an identical species leads them to develop in different directions and not to interbreed so if they develop in different directions sooner or later they may potentially become two di distinct species if they both lineages survive. Of course, if one lineage goes extinct, then you end up with just one species that's developing in a, a different direction. And you can't say, well, there was a speciation event because there wasn't really. Define what it means to be in separate species. What does it mean? What does species mean? <clears throat> it's, it's undefinable. That's the problem. Darwin did not state at all clearly what differences made two organisms in, into different species because he did not know and we still don't. Um, one of the obvious issues is about interbreeding but we say lions and tigers are different species but they can interbreed. There are ligons <coughs> and tied ligers? ligers, yeah, ligers, yeah. Um, they, they can interbreed and produce fertile young. So they're obviously separated fairly recently and they're not sufficiently far apart that they can't interbreed. But because tigers are Asian and lions are essentially African and West Asian, they don't interbreed naturally. So it's an entirely artificial thing that we have imposed on them, which simply tells us that they must have speciated fairly recently. And they're not different enough, well, like with, with us and chimpanzees having a very different number of chromosomes. So we can't interbreed with chimpanzees. We've got 32 chromosomes, they've got about 50 or something. So um, even if you match a sperm and an egg, you're not going to produce anything. But lions and tigers are close enough that they can. And similarly, um, several of the, the canid species can interbreed, which is why dingoes, which are not very closely related to European dogs, do interbreed with them. They've been separated for many, many thousands of years, but they can produce fertile young. So we've got hybrids all over the place. How do we categorise human intervention, like um, inserting sort of marine genes into a tomato variety 
so as to produce more uh, resilient crops. This is genetic engineering. Yes. Um, that produces a like a heritable difference in a tomato. Is that a separate species? There's a there's a very closely related worry that because these things are grown on farms and possibly neighbouring farms have uh, varieties that are not genetically modified, the drift of pollen or the drift of seeds um, on wind windblown things can end up polluting the um, natural gene pool. And that, that can cause real problems in, in our interference with the natural world. Um, so that our genetically modified things in effect take over the population if they're better at survival. And again, you won't know that for many, many generations. The anxiety that five years from now, um, genetically modified tomatoes will displace unmodified tomatoes is probably exaggerated. But over many thousands of generations, given um, the possible drift of seed or pollen or whatever, it's, it's quite possible. Um, yeah. And that's, that's one of the big unknowns, that we often do things, we're tinkering with the world and don't really know what the long-term consequences will be. This is something that worries you. Um, well, it doesn't particularly worry me. Um, it, it, it worries a lot of uh, people who are obviously very hostile to genetic splicing. Um, there's obviously a, a very big, mainly sort of counterculture movement, which is motivated to some extent by a very strong anti-science ethos, which I don't share. Um, but some of it seems to um, have concerns I think should be taken seriously about, uh, I said, uh, polluting natural gene pools, particularly for things like modified grains. And all grasses have seeds that are essentially windblown. So if um, modified ones blow into areas which are unmodified, um, it, it possibly could cause long-term uh, loss of gene pools, and I think that's a, that's a genuine concern. Um, I'm not a, a biological scientist, so I've got a very amateur opinion about it, and I can't offer a professional opinion about it. It's, it's something I've, I've read about, sort of generally, and um, accept may well be a genuine concern. But I think a great deal of the hostility to genetic modification is very much a counterculture, anti-science thing, um, by people who have learnt some of the terminology, but don't really understand the science. What's the importance then, zeroing in on understanding science, that you think um, uh, the culture of knowing what Darwin did helps? Um, because there is so much nonsense um, in people's heads about the, the relationship or lack of, of various organisms on Earth, and how things have changed over time. Uh, I just find it very liberating to me to protect me from accepting nonsense and uh, uh, having, having a genuine understanding of how the world works. It's simply, it's, it's very similar to my fascination with astronomy. Um, <clears throat> some people say, well, stars are just little points of light up there. They're just stars. They're all the same. And they're not. They're just radically different. You look, get, look through a, a decent telescope or get a, a really nice um, photographic atlas of the stars and galaxies and nebulae and so forth around the universe, and they're just stunningly different. And we now understand they're about 14 billion years old, which only 200 years ago was just unthinkable. Um, the idea that the whole universe was a mere 6,000 years old was still very, very widely accepted throughout European cultures and we've demolished that in a very, very short time. And it's been very hard for a lot of people to get used to that. But the more you understand, um, even as a dabbler, sort of a dilettante dabbler like I am, um, about what has been learnt in all that time, the more liberated you are from living in sort of pre-scientific nonsense concepts. And I've just found that wonderful. One of the fundamental things about science is um, whatever theoretical explanation you have for some phenomenon has to fit well with all your theoretical explanations of every other phenomena. And it's, it's one of the <coughs> nonsenses of creationism. They say, well, you, all you do is just change the date at which the world started. You change nothing else. As, as though you can do that, and you can't. And once you understand that, then it protects you from living in a world where you've, your head's full of nonsense concepts. And I, I just find that, for me, 
personally very, very valuable. I like to have a genuine understanding and not have my head full of nonsense. Do you think it matters that um, there's more people in the population that have genuine understanding rather than uh, fake mystical understandings of the way the world works and why? Um, <clears throat> yes, for, for many, many reasons. One is it determines very much what you do with your life. Um, do you attend temples where people worship gods that can't possibly exist? Um, do you take your children out of school because school will corrupt them from their faith? Um, <clears throat> what you believe has a powerful influence on how you live and where you will live and what sorts of other people you will associate with and what tolerance you have for other people who've got different ideas. Um, the more you understand, um, <clears throat> the more sense you can make of um, the, the, stu the stupid behaviours people get into when their heads are full of nonsense. And I, I, just say, so I feel powerfully liberated from all that because I'm not even tempted to go into lifestyles which are based around nonsense beliefs. Uh, I, I, I enjoy being protected from that very much. I grew up in a family where um, <clears throat> my parents and all my cousins were full of nonsense beliefs and I've spent a great deal of my life liberating myself from all that, which is um, something I, I treasure, having been able to do that. <coughs> well, just, just as one pretty important example, uh, from what I've read, there are various African dictatorships where the dictators are totally hostile to the medications which have been used for dealing with AIDS. And they will not allow people to practice um, medical treatment in, within their nations which will deal with AIDS. And so Africa is an AIDS disaster. It's, I think it's been expected for quite a long time now that the whole population of Africa will start radically reducing because of the enormous death rate, particularly of young children, from AIDS. Um, and that's just utterly insane. Um, once, once you've got a, a clear understanding that AIDS is just a virus and it's not a moral issue at all, it's a health issue and it can be dealt with and contained, as we did in Australia, very rapidly. I think it's... Um, Australia had the, the best program on planet Earth for dealing with it promptly and effectively and so the AIDS, the AIDS epidemic here was much, much smaller than in virtually every other OECD country because we, we were so sensible in our way of treating with it. And what, from what I've read about the absolute disaster in Africa, if those dictators and their um, bureaucrat um, advisers could have some good sense in their heads instead of this, the crazy views they seem to have, um, our world will be much less dangerous. Um, and that's just, just one of many, many instances where we can survive better. Uh, the, the treatment of the Ebola virus in West Africa was very, very sensible. They got onto it really quickly, they developed vaccines, they isolated people in ways that uh, prevented them from communicating their disease to other people and it, it suppressed what threatened to become a worldwide pandemic and didn't. Um, AIDS has, except in Australia. Um, another probably historical example is the case of thalidomide. Uh, the, the rigour that was applied by the Therapeutic Goods Administration in the USA, where they had a woman in charge of approval of um, applications for manufacture and dissemination of new medicines, and she said, you have claimed that these things are not dangerous for pregnant women, show me the evidence. And they couldn't, and she didn't approve it. They were much slacker in Australia, so we had, I think, 10,000 cases of teratogenic deformities. So once you understand the, the teratogenic possibilities of medications and the importance of getting really solid evidence for something, you can protect people from that sort of disaster. Now, there's, there's thousands and thousands of stories like that where having a rigorous understanding of something makes a radical difference to whole populations. Well, what role do you see humanism playing in shaping progress of ethical standards in the world? How does 
Darwin shape into all of this if if he does? Uh, I don't I don't know that Darwin had much influence on on ethical development. Um, he was always <clears throat> deeply respectful of people whose views were different from his own. Um, mainly because his wife was probably the closest one to him. She was a deeply devout Christian and he knew that his theory um, put the whole basis as in his time of Christianity under serious threat and so he was very cautious about how he expressed himself and did, was ultra cautious about potentially offending other people. Um, <coughs> humanism puts a very, very strong emphasis on having decisions based upon scientific knowledge, which I think, I think is always extremely important. Um, <coughs> for example, the, 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 the current huge debate has been going on for the last half century about permitting or restraining abortion um, sees it essentially as um, some sort of moral issue um, instead of being a health issue. Uh, I see it essentially as being a health issue. Um, and what, what, what you have is that the feminists who say women should have an absolute right over their own bodies, though of course what's happened is something that's not just their own bodies, it's the man who inseminated them, it's the baby that's growing, and their own bodies. And so it's not that simple. But then the um, right to life people claim that it's entirely about murder that all that's going on is murder of a potential human being. And of course it's not that simple. And the passage of legislation in quite a few American states recently, since the Supreme Court changed their, their, the rule about Ro Rowan Wade, to say abortion must not be committed to anybody under any circumstances whatever. So victims of rape, um, ectothermic pregnancies, where it's actually going to kill the mother because the thing is implanted in the, the um, fallopian tube rather than in the uterus. doesn't matter. You don't commit abortions. And I, th I just see that as totally evil. It's um, ideological bigotry because people refuse to understand the way human biology actually works and what's going on. And so they end up with very um, rigid, bigoted positions. Uh, <clears throat> the Rowan Wade decision uh, was based upon the idea that a, a decision about to having an abortion or not was something private between a woman and her doctor. And I think that was incredibly sensible. Um, it was wonderfully lampooned in Monty Python's uh, meaning of life about every sperm is sacred. And <laughs> you start off with this image of this uh, father surrounded by half a dozen kids and by the end of the song he's got about a hundred thousand and it's it's straight out of Malthus. Um, one of the quotes I just recently read in Darwin's Origin of Species is he was looking at the, the potential population of elephants from a single founding pair and he worked out it, because they're very slow breeders they don't start breeding until about 30 or 40 years old and they don't have many children in their lifetimes but he estimated within 500 years there would be 5 million elephants from one founding pair and earth could not possibly support that many so the idea that killing a fetus or killing a sperm is evil is just insane um, <clears throat> you have to see abortion as part of population control and i see it very much in terms of the appalling overpopulation of humans on planet earth already and so the biblical injunction to increase and multiply and replenish the earth might have made some sense 3,000 years ago. It is totally evil now. We are destroying planet earth by overpopulating it and taking all the resources just for one species. And so that um, my understanding of, of human physiology, part of which Darwin contributed to, um, I think leads me to have a more benign attitude to population control, part of which is about um, being quite happy to accept abortion and not seeing it as the sort of um, sin against God that religious people see it as, which I think just totally misunderstands what they're doing when they're prohibiting abortions. So there's, again, it's just one of many, many thousands of issues where understanding the nature of organisms and understanding the nature of evolution and understanding the nature of the development of populations of which Darwinia, Darwinism is, is um, a very important part um, helps you make much more sensible decisions about 
what you will do to manage our life on planet Earth. A bit controversial and don't feel obliged to answer this question, but I've heard you use the word evil a few times. I'm just wondering, what is it that makes something evil? Is it a lack of understanding? Is it willful misunderstanding? What, what is it? Uh, it's, it's many, many factors. I, I don't think anything on Earth has a single cause. Everything's got multi, multiple causes. Um, defining evil is probably close to impossible. Um, Dostoevsky had a, had a, a brilliant attempt at it, um, murder of babies, which is what abortion's about, um, infanticide, uh, torture of babies and so forth. It's just, that's absolutely appalling. There's no, no argument that that is evil. Um, but again, he took that out of context. If you're simply looking at a baby, which you would think should be nurtured and brought to adulthood in a healthy manner, um, killing a baby is just awful. If the baby is doomed to die in the next few weeks anyway because it's got some appalling deformity which guarantees it won't last long and its last few weeks will be appallingly painful, then killing the baby is quite different. It's like me taking a knife and cutting you open. That would be a terrible thing to do. But if I'm a surgeon and I'm about to save your life, it's a wonderful thing to do. So everything depends on context. Um, because I'm a conservationist, I'm a very active conservation worker, I see a lot of what we are doing to planet Earth, populating it with weeds, for example, populating it with um, pest animals, rabbits and foxes and feral cats and so forth, and protecting them, doing nothing about it, like as, as is happening with the deer population in Victoria. They're, they're a protected species because looking after them for the big game hunters is regarded as a sort of no untouchable sacred duty of, of, of parliaments. I see that as evil. They are very, very, very destructive animals. Protecting the brumbies up in the, the high country is evil. The scientists have been saying for generations now they are doing immense damage to the echoes, very fragile ecosystems of our alpine ecology. Um, and the the man from Snowy River culture, the, 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 the mountain cattlemen saying Brumbies are part of our heritage, is just evil. It's saying this one thing is the only thing that matters and all this other stuff which the scientists agree is pretty dreadful just doesn't matter. Um, if, if you have a, a proper value system, you don't do evil things and I think uh, lots of people have just very distorted value system which lead them to do nasty things which have terrible consequences. What's the reason for these distorted value systems? Um, again, multiple, multiple causes. People grow up with a certain way of life uh, and that gives them a certain value system. Um, people, for example, who grow up on cattle farms and just routinely slaughter cattle have a very different attitude from people who are vegetarians like me. Okay, and it's very much a matter of um, the lifestyle people have chosen to live and the community that they want to be accepted by uh, and whether they would like to have an influence on their wider society or just content to be takers rather than makers of culture. Um, for myself, I'm, I've long been a maker of culture, but by and large I'm a taker of culture. Of course, I can't make everything. Um, and some people just want to have a big influence and become leaders of groups and be worshipped by their groups and so forth and usually end up being pretty, pretty horrible. Like the um, exposure of the um, evang evangelical leaders who froth at the mouth about their, their congregation's sexual misdemeanours and they're found years later to have committed multiple adulteries and so on and visited prostitutes and so forth and being totally hypocritical and bigoted um, just because of our, our bizarre celebrity culture which says there are no rules for celebrities celebrities can do whatever they like with impunity and it's just one of the sicknesses of our modern world um, I'm very much a follower of Stephen Pinker to say in, in almost every way you can possibly imagine our world is much much better than that of our grandparents generation but in some ways like the, the emergence of celebrity culture it's just much worse it's something that worries me a great deal <clears throat> so there's good things going on and there's bad things going on. It's a very complex world. Um, I'm 
living in an upper middle class suburb and in some ways living an upper middle class life um, and the upper middle class life is destroying our planet because all of us uh, emit greenhouse gases far more than our planet can cope with probably including me I try very hard not to but it's virtually impossible not to and doing that without taking it seriously is truly evil because it's not going to damage just us it's going to damage everything and people who are blasé about it or uh, contrarians I think are fermenting evil <clears throat> One of the things I've just been reading um, in Dennett's book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, is his effort to connect um, evolutionary theory with culture and language. What is the contribution of culture and language to evolution? And his, in a thumbnail, um, his idea is it has accelerated it immensely. Ideas spread with enormous rapidity across the entire human population as a result of the fact that we have cultural development. Um, so enormous cultures have languages and cultural practices in common and ideas spread rapidly and things change really rapidly or things become rigid for a long time in the whole culture. And that has had a, a huge impact on evolution. Um, it's something I had never really thought about before. And what's, what's the contribution of language to that? Well, it's obviously one of the main means by which culture gets spread. Um, and one result is um, humans are accelerating evolution um, at an immensely greater speed than has ever happened before in the whole history of planet Earth. One aspect of that, of course, what we were talking about earlier, which is the effort to tackle bacteria and viruses. We're generating drug-resistant bacteria um, in ways that were just unthinkable only a century ago. Um, penicillin was uh, invented two years before I was born in 1943. It's only 80 years ago now, and it's generated in only 80 years enormous varieties of extremely drug-resistant bacteria. With, you can't fight them in, with anything, even with whole um, cocktails of, of drugs. They're just totally resistant to everything. So we're, we're in that sweet, sweet spot, I think. Um, I went to a lecture some years ago by a German academic who was over here talking about um, the issue of climate change and he started off his lecture by asking two questions of the audience. One of which was he said, put up your hands if you think your life has been better than that of your grandparents. And every hand went up. And then he said, put up your hands if you think your children will have a better life than you do. And hardly any hand went up. That's a profound, very profound pessimism. My hand didn't go up either, because I'm that profoundly pessimistic. Well, I think a lot of our generation accept that we are in that sweet spot. Things have never been as good, and they won't ever be this good again. And that depresses me a great deal. I would like to leave a good world for my children, and my children's grandchildren, and their grandchildren, and I can't. I'm a teeny weeny little single human being. I can try my best, but I'm just one out of 8,000 million. So I wish it wasn't so. It bothers me a great deal. And a great deal of the problem has come from the wonders of medical science, which keep us all alive. Um, the idea that virtually everybody will live into their 80s and possibly 90s was just unthinkable a century ago. And that's one of the primary factors in huge population increase. The idea that infant mortality would be down to 0.01% was just unthinkable a century ago. People accepted that four out of 10 children would get buried before their second birthday. Um, so the most evil people on earth are the medical researchers who are making all that possible because they're helping us to destroy the planet. It's just the two-edged sword of virtually everything that goes on. It's just wonderful, but it's terrible. Mm bothers me a lot. I, I treasure it. I'm alive because of those medical researchers. There are many situations where I would have died if, if it wasn't for them, but they're helping to destroy the planet. Everybody on planet Earth aspires to have the upper middle class lifestyle that I've got. 
and the, the planet can't cope with it. If 8,000 million people want to live like me, we destroy the planet in no time. The only reason I can have my comfortable lifestyle is that 7,000 million of those people are much, much poorer than me. Mm.